Hello, everyone. This is Kyle Galaz with Poor to Pro Car Sales Training Podcast. Become a sales titan. We are in Season 7, Episode 2, talking about sometimes we struggle. Yes, the car business will test us. Yes, our minds will test us. There's a lot of things that will test us, and sometimes we do struggle. But this episode is going to confront some of these struggles that we have as car salespeople, even me as a sales manager, and find a way around it, find a way through it, so that way we can keep pressing forward and keep making those sales to be the number one salesperson at your dealership. The point of learning, the point of training is to have a goal. And the goal should be, I need to be the best version of your, of yourself, of myself, so we're not leaving anything on the table. And that's how you become that sales titan making that 100K plus a year. You guys are probably getting close. If you've been listening to the podcast since it came out, you've probably learned a lot of things and hopefully you're getting darn close or you've surpassed it. I would love to hear from all of you uh, salespeople out there that are finally getting over that 100K mark. Message me on Facebook, Kyle Galaz, K-Y-L-E-G-A-L-A-Z. Let me know how close you've gotten to that 100K. Let me know how far you've beaten it by. And uh, I'd like to congratulate you and talk with you and, and message me. You can also message me on Instagram. Go to Porta Pro underscore car sales training. Make sure you guys follow all my links on the description of this episode. Go down there and click all my links. Check things out. You know, I'm here to help you from all different angles. And I appreciate your, your guys' support, kind words. If you know someone out there that you think would benefit from a car sales training podcast, and you like Porter Pro, share the podcast right now. Click the share button and send it. Do it now so you don't forget. And send it to three or four salespeople out there that even if they've been in the car business a long time, give them the opportunity to learn. Because if we can raise all of our levels up, then we have the advantage over the over the customers. We have the advantage over the market because we are the professionals and people will spend more money with professionals. So if everyone can elevate their skills, then guess what? Everyone makes more money. All right, now let's talk about season eight real quick before we get on with this episode. I need to book 10 one-on-ones for season eight. So if you've been thinking about, hey, I'm thinking about booking a one-on-one uh, episode with with Kyle, this is the time to get in on episode eight. Be a part of the podcast forever. It's only 149 uh, USD. You get to pick three to four topics that you want to elevate in the car business, and let's get together. I send you the Zoom link. It's super easy, and I put together a game plan to get you in the right direction. So that way you can start making that 100 k or more a year, 10000 or more a month, and it's such a small investment if you do the math and do the percentage. 149 bucks we spend on random stuff during the week. So invest in yourself. That is the only way it happens. No one's going to do it for you. Make sure you reach out to me. Let's book these one-on-one sessions so that way in Season 8 you get to be known. Your links will be in there and you get to be a part of the podcast forever. I appreciate it. All right. Let's get into this episode, Season 7, Episode 2, Sometimes We Struggle. Now, I have a list in front of me, and I could probably put a list of a 100 different items, but I also have to make an episode to this podcast not too long. No one wants to listen to a three-hour session of a podcast, unless you're Joe Rogan, and he's quite intriguing, Um, and he's got really cool guests, and I'm hoping one day I can have guests like that, and and you salespeople out there on my podcast face-to-face, uh, and I get to travel the U.S. and meet you guys and girls and do the podcast live with someone in front of me. It's a, a dream of mine, and I'm going to keep pressing forward, and hopefully I get to meet you salespeople in person. But this list is about, I don't know, 15 items, and I'm sure we'll ad-lib some in here, so it could grow. But I want to keep this episode uh, you know, for your commutes and your you know, in-between customers and timely. So... <clears throat> Let's get into this. The car business will test us. And there's a lot of things that will test us to make us either stronger or break. And the salespeople that break end up leaving the car business. And then they come back and buy a car and say, oh, yeah, I used to sell cars. I know how it works. No, you didn't. 
because no one good in the car business ever leaves the car business. It's too easy. It's too much money, and it, it's a free uh, a, a free lifestyle. And there's too many perks to being an elite salesperson. So, it, you know, when the car business tests us. This is our moment to shine. This is our moment to rise to the occasion. Are you going to drown or are you going to swim to shore and make that that big money? You you got to pick one and the car business is going to force it out of you. It's going to either push you out of the car business or it's going to make you stronger. And hopefully you're at the point now where it's like, okay, I'm never leaving the car business. Now, how can I take advantage of every single day I'm in the car business so I can have a a lavish, fun lifestyle where I'm out hanging out with everybody and I get to pay for dinners and I get to say, nope, it's on me and and have a a round of cigars and a beautiful drink. And, you know, like, let's, let's get to that level in the car business to where you are the highest paid person in your circle. The car business can provide that. It's it's crazy to think that little old me can go into a car dealership with not much talent, not much uh, information, start selling cars, and next thing you know, I'm one of the highest paid people in my, my circle. That is you. That can be you. And you may know a salesperson already in your circle that's making that gigantic amount of money that you haven't met someone that makes that kind of money unless they were born with it from their parents and the silver spoon. This is where the car business can be one of the most rewarding jobs. It can be one of the funnest, high-paying jobs or one of the hardest, low-paying jobs. And trust me, I've made those checks where I think, those paychecks where I'm like, what am I doing here? And the car business tested me with those low low paychecks. And I said, nope, next month, watch what I, watch what I do. And that needs to be you. So let's talk about some of these struggles and get motivated, man. Get pumped. Think about this stuff, pause it, and think, I can do this. Tell yourself, I can do this. I can make an uh, an enormous amount of money and have an enormous amount of success and be the highest paid earner in my circle of friends and, and family, right? Pause it, say it. Okay, now play it back. Let's get back into this. Okay, the first, the first and one of the big struggles that we have as salespeople is economic changes. Stuff that's out of our control, What am I supposed to do when gas goes up to five bucks a gallon, six bucks a gallon, seven bucks a gallon, and customers are gun shy about buying these half ton trucks, these gas guzzler vehicles, or they're just not coming in, you know, off the street because they're not making as much as they used to kind of like we're dealing with right now. Inflation is high. Incomes are tight. Family bills are high. Debt is high. How do I make a difference and how do I Uh, overcome this struggle of economic changes because when the good is good you can sit back and be an order taker you don't even have to try to sell we saw that in in the the pandemic time you you just showed up to work and you're probably selling a car that's an order taker the sale makers are the ones that in the down times the down times they can still perform and take a look at your dealership right now and look at who there's going to be a salesman of the month Regardless of the economy being bad or good, there will be a salesman of the month. There'll be a second place salesperson. There'll be a third place salesperson. There's going to be a top five, and then there's going to be your bottom salespeople. Every month, there's always a salesperson of the month every month. Why can't that be you? Why can't you be top three every month? Because no matter how bad the economy is or how good it is, someone is making a tremendous amount of money that month. Maybe not as good as the old days, you know, with with people making 15, 20, 30,000 a month, 40,000 a month I saw with my own eyes um, in that time, but they're still going to be number one. Make that you. So how do we deal with these economic changes? How do we deal with inflation? How do we do all this? You have to triple down the output. You can't just do your normal, uh, you know, come to work and you know, call these leads and I, you know, I sent 10 emails and I sent 20 emails and these texts. No, you have to triple your number. You have to triple the calls. You have to triple the text messages. You have to triple the emails. You have to triple the output because if, if it's slow by three times, that means you have to work three times extra to get back to that normal. It's, it's, it's math. Oh my gosh, our dealership is selling a third of the vehicles. Well, guess what that tells you? You need to do a 
uh, three times more work to get yours. Don't worry about the dealership. Don't worry about your coworkers. You just worry about yourself. And when the economic changes happen and times are slow, then you need to triple down. Find out what your dealership is selling versus the good times. Are we one third the sales? Are we two thirds the sales? Are we half the sales? And take that number and and times that. So if we're down by, uh, you know, two thirds, then you need to do the math and and double or triple or quadruple your work ethic. Yes, it's it's a lot of work. Of course, it's a lot of work. We go to work to work. We clock in to to make money. And sometimes during the work day, we we clock in for nine hours, but we only worked three of those nine hours. The other six hours were smoking and joking and in the huddles and wandering and grabbing lunch and you know not really fulfilling the day with work. So if and this is an old Joe Verdi thing, if you work nine hours, if you're at the the I'm sorry, the average salesperson in a nine hour shift works three actual hours. The average salesperson sells about 10 cars a a month. So by working three hours a day, the average salesperson can sell 10 cars a month. Okay. Now let's say it's, it's slower right now and we're having this economic crisis and we're not, the average salesperson is only selling seven to eight cars now. That just tells me that I need to work more hours during my nine-hour shift. So instead of working three or four hours, I need to actually work nine hours. When I get to work, I need to put in the time. I need to grind. I'm sorry, distractions. I'm sorry, distractions. I got work to do because if I want to be the number one guy, even in these economic crisis, in these changes, I just got to triple down or quadruple down my work ethic. I need to take more ups. I need to work the service drive. I need to make more phone calls. I need to send more internet or emails. I need to post three times a day instead of just one time a day. I need to make that many more phone calls. I have to triple down my work ethic. And that's how you can overcome the economic changes. So when you have a tougher time in the economy, that's when you have to triple down on your work ethic or double double time. But you can't stay where you're at in your current work ethic and expect to sell just as many cars or more when we're having an economic crisis and gas is up and inflation is up and jobs are down and money's down and families are tight on on money. That just means you have to uh, contact more families. You have to contact more businesses. You have to work the service drive a little extra. You have to call and ask for referrals. You have to see if your sold customers want to come back and buy another one because you have a new program. you got to get creative in contacting people and you have to triple down. All right. Another thing we struggle with is competition. How many times does a customer come in and say, oh, the guy down the street has a better deal? Of course they do. Every every dealership down the street has a better deal when you're a customer, right? That's just what they say. So we have a lot of uh, tough competition out there right now. And, <clears throat> and I want to talk about something in this in just a second that I feel like you can accomplish and you can become this salesperson that I'm about to talk about. But there's competition in other brands and there's even competition in your own brand out there. Some big cities require the the manufacturer like Ford or Chevy or Toyota require a big city to have multiple points of, of dealerships. Well, guess what? That's a different, different company, same brand. Now, now we're fighting over someone can drive 15, 20 minutes down the, the highway and save 500 bucks. Yeah, I would drive 20 minutes to save 500 bucks. Absolutely. So you have intense competition out there within your cities. Now, a smaller city that's more isolated, you do have a, a, a better chance of selling the hometown people. The problem with that is there's not a whole lot of hometown people in these smaller cities. So you have to reach out to the cities that probably have that dealership at at you know, in those bigger cities. So there's always going to be tough competition. So what, what can you do as a salesperson, right? The dealership's going to advertise and the dealership's going to do their best, but what can you do as a salesperson to be better than the competition? Because there's good competition out there. You're going to run into people that, that, customers are going to run into salespeople that are sales titans that are selling 20 to 30 cars a month. That's your competition. Not necessarily the dealership. It's the say it's the individual salesperson at those dealerships that could sell ice to an Eskimo. 
right? That could sell ketchup to a, a lady in a white dress, whatever those terminologies were. That is your actual competition. So how do you become a salesperson that has no competition? Think about it. There's always competition, Kyle. When you get to an elite level and you get to that status of, of sales titan and you're selling that a crazy amount of cars a month and you have that charisma and you have that knowledge and you have that know-how and you have that ability to overcome injections, objections, you know how to close deals and you know how to be passionate with your product and you know your product and you take those customers through the process properly with all these skills, you have no competition. They will never leave you and shop the competition. When you are that good with customers, they're not going to leave because in your sales pitch, you're going to slowly drop seeds of doubt at those other dealerships. Oh, yeah, they're going to advertise $500 less than us every time. But when you get there, you're going to find out nine loopholes you have to go through that you probably won't qualify for. You know, those type of things. When you get to that that level, you actually start getting less and less competition because your competition is the other salespeople. Because what happens when a customer says, hey, I'm going to go look around and they leave you? They go look around at different brands and they find a brand that's like, eh, it's not that great. But then they run into that salesperson that knows how to close. They run into that salesperson that knows how to overcome objections. And that competition just won. It wasn't the dealership, the building talking to that customer. It wasn't the pretty color talking to the customer. It wasn't the receptionist that talked him into it. It wasn't the brand. It was the salesperson they met that has that elite skill level that sold that customer. So when they said, I'm going to look around, I'm probably buying next week. And they left and met a real salesperson, an elite salesperson. That's your actual competition. The guy over there that puts on the show, the girl over there that puts on the show and gets their business business today. So when it comes to competition, yes, there's other brands out there. There's other, uh, you know, Uh, dealerships that are the same brand but the real competition is the person that they're going to run into at that dealership and that person needs to be you and your closing ratio needs to go up so how do we become the elite salesperson without any competition you train you train every single day you listen to podcasts you do worksheets you do uh uh, walk arounds with your manager. You do play by plays with salespeople. You always train because the sharpest tools are the ones that get things done. If you got an old rusty tool and you're trying to work with it, it's not going to get the job done right. It may fail. But if you have a, a brand new hammer, a brand new screwdriver, whatever it is, there's no rust, it's perfectly sharp, and you want to go execute what you got to do with that tool, boom, it's done. You got the job done, so you need to be extremely sharp and, and focused on why you're at the dealership. All right, moving on. Another challenge we have is a changing industry. A lot of salespeople, when they get hired at a dealership, they learn. They learn all the products. They get really good with the products because they the manager said, hey, if you want to get on the sales floor, you have to complete these certifications. You got to learn all the products. And guess what? That new salesperson knows everything about it. You probably met that salesperson. Oh, it's got 320 horsepower, 365 foot-pounds of torque, does a 060 in this. And oh, the truck, yeah, it has a 12,500 towing capacity because that salesperson just got done learning because the only way he could sell is by having to go through these courses and he really paid attention because he doesn't want to look like a fool at his new car sales job. That's why a lot of new salespeople come out of the gate and sell a bunch of cars because they're ramped up on the fact that they got a job, they're ramped up on the product, and they've recently done training certifications. So in a changing industry, if you've been at your dealership six years or seven years, vehicles have changed many, many times. Your vehicles, the competition's vehicles have changed many times. EV, electric vehicles, hybrid, gas, plug-in hybrid. Uh, customers talking about how fossil fuels are bad for the the, uh, the earth. And then you have other customers talking about how lithium ion battery, lithium uh, mining fields are worse than fossil fuels. You got to stay up on all this stuff. So when you get these customers, you know what to say and you know how to overcome the objections. If a customer comes in for an EV and you don't know anything about EVs, do you think you're going to sell that customer or do you think you're going to lose that customer? So what I get, what I'm getting back at is if you've been at a dealership for five, six, 10 years, 
you got to go back to those drawing boards of learning your product because they've changed so much. How many salespeople out there that have been at your dealership for, you've been at your dealership for 10 or 15 years can still remember the horsepower of the cars you were selling 10 years ago? Think about it. Think about it right now. 10 years ago, I started selling cars. I can remember the horsepower of that and the torque of that and this because you cared back then about your products. And you didn't want to look like a fool. Now try to say some of the horsepowers of today's vehicles if you've been in the car business a long time. Can you even mention any horsepowers? Hopefully you can. But if not, this is what I'm talking about when we struggle with product in the changing industry. We have to stay up up on our product. And that is a struggle for salespeople that have been around for a little while. They, they forget, I better know my product. Now product isn't everything. Customers buy because of you. But there's specific types of customers that you're going to run into that product does matter and those are the deals that might be slipping through your fingers right now that you're missing that one to three extra car deals a month of course you're going to sell the lay me the uh, you know the the lay down everyone sells the lay down but what about those engineer types they're looking for specifics what about the person that has specific questions about your brand versus the competition's brand those are the things we have to stay up on so a changing industry our vehicles are changing two, three times every, you know, three or four years. And uh, you just want to make sure you're staying, staying up on that. It's something we struggle with, something we can overcome. Okay, something else that we struggle with is the digital lifestyle. A lot of salespeople out there are still hesitant about getting on social media, posting videos, posting memes about car business, posting silly things out there about the car business and tagging your dealership and inviting customers and, and, and letting the public know on social media that I am a car salesperson, this is where I work, I love what I do. People like passionate people, especially when it comes to their careers, and they're attracted to people that are uh, that love their careers. So get out there and get on social media and start posting videos of yourself talking about a car, even if your face isn't on camera, just your voice. Or when you sell a vehicle, take a picture with your customer. Get familiar with being on 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 social media and in that digital life. You, we got to get out of those old sales techniques where we just hope a customer remembers us. It's not like that anymore. the The customer remembers the person that's in front of them every single day. And if you're posting fun stuff and you friended them on Facebook and Instagram and followed them on TikTok, you're integrated in their life. And when they post something about little Johnny had a fourth birthday, you can say congratulations. Uh, is he getting a new car? And have fun on. On social media and the common denominator when you're posting vehicles of you with your customers who bought cars is you the customer is going to change every time the car is going to change every time the dealership might even change every time if you switch dealerships but you know what's never going to change you so when you're posting on social media be in each picture with your customers shaking their hands uh handing them the key you know everyone has smiles it's always happy and then you can put on there who's next Come see me, get a car, you know, and, and have fun with that. So a lot of salespeople out there, including myself at one point, d didn't grasp the digital lifestyle, the, the social media lifestyle, because we were unfamiliar with it. We were scared to dive into it. But trust me, if you do it, you're going to start seeing more interactions and your chances of selling cars to people that you've never met because you happen to post a vehicle on Facebook Marketplace and they went to your profile and saw your phone number right in your profile. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about to, to get out of that, that slump we're in and selling that 8 to 10 cars every month. we got to do new things and we got to uh, fix things that we're struggling with. All right, moving on. Well-informed customers. Customers are smart, but guess who's smarter? A well-informed salesperson. If you know your product like the back of your hand and you've driven them every day and you're actually being interactive with your with your inventory and checking out the, the cool new colors and the new wheels and, and you know counting your inventory and just you're being interactive with your uh, products and your inventory and your and your shop and your body shop and all the stuff you are more informed than a well-informed customer it's embarrassing when a customer when i was in sales knew more about the car than i did so i because of that i hated being embarrassed i wanted to be the professional i'm the sales titan and i wanted to know everything about everything that i was selling and that was one of my things i would tell customers it's like try to stump me come on 
try to stump me. Well, what's the horsepower? Boom. What's the torque? Boom. What's the 060? Boom. What's the top speed? Boom. What's the uh, whatever? Boom. What kind of this does it have? Boom. And and the try to stump me thing, I would say, it was fun. The customer was laughing. The customer was trying to find things on the car. Well, guess what was happening when, when I was t- telling them to try to stump me? They were having fun. They were smiling. They were opening things up. They were pointing at stuff. What's this made out of? Leather. What's this? Suede. What's that? Alcantara. What's this? Aluminum. What's this? Uh, you know, walnut, whatever type of wood it was. What, what's the hood made out of? Carbon fiber. What's the roof made out of? Carbon fiber. But it's painted. Uh, you know, all these little things that that we should know. So to, to handle, and we do struggle with well-informed customers. Don't get me wrong. But to, to combat a well-informed customer, you need to be a well-informed salesperson with your product and with the competition. And if you can do that, no one can stump you. Now, d- do I expect you to know everything? No, no one knows everything, okay? But should you know a lot more than your customers? Absolutely. Should you be able to tell them about things that they're going to experience on the test drive that they can't Google? When they're on the manufacturer's website, it doesn't say that your transmission uh, you know, when it shifts, it makes these awesome explosions out the exhaust because it's a sports car and it's supposed to do that at high RPMs. It doesn't say that on the website, I promise you. And those are the type of things that get customers on, on a test drive. So if we're struggling with well-informed customers, then you need to become a well-informed salesperson, a professional, and you will outperform that, that customer that comes in that's well-informed. All right. Here's another thing we struggle with, a person, uh, personal and work-life balance. Our personal life and our work-life balance. Yes, it is tough. It is tough, especially if we have little kids at home and we have a spouse at home and we bring our work home, we bring our attitudes home, we bring our frustrations home and, and we're at home and we have a fight and we go to work and we still have that fight in our mind and we can't operate properly at work because we're texting a, a you know World War III over the phone with our spouse or our girlfriend or our boyfriend. Personal life and work-life balance is very difficult. And this is where time and experience comes in. If you expect in your first three months of car sales to have figured this out, don't. But I promise you it will come. And some salespeople never turn off their cell uh, cell phones. They have learned to live with their cell phone right next to them. And no matter who texts them or calls them, they answer. That's kind of me. Uh, my boss calls me. It doesn't matter where I'm at. I answer it. My my uh, our regional manager dude that calls me, answer text answer Facebook message answer. I I'm addicted to the car business. And yes, does it affect my personal life? Yes. However, I have a very understanding. Uh, wife and kids that understand that that daddy is out trying to make our lives better and I and I'm open and upfront about it and I've talked with them about you know what I'm trying to achieve what are my goals and they know Kyle is on a mission and and they just let me do my thing so open conversations with people at home might help your scenario I also have a salesperson that when he's off I can't get a hold of him he turns his phone off or he leaves it in another room and I know that when he is off I'm gonna call him and ask him about a car deal or a, a vehicle he has a, a hold on and it's gonna be tough to get a hold of him and I respect that because he he operates differently with his family and his children so the personal life slash work life balance, I guess my my real thing is there is no balance. If you're looking to have that balance, I don't think it exists. I think what it is is a series of of sacrifices from each side. And I think if you have an open discussion with the people you live with, I think you're going to find a solution to figure out that quote-unquote life balance, work balance. Uh, because it is very tough to, to be trying to go to the next level of your career and of, of income and still you know, try to do everything you can in your personal life. It's like something has to give, something has to break for you to go to the next level. And if you're doing 50-50 right now, 50% personal, 50% work, then you're going to have 50% income. If you want to go to a higher level of of income, then you're going to have to put more percentage into work. And once you figure out where you want to be, then that, that balance 
can work itself out a little bit. Um, it, you know, the work and, and personal life balance is tough. And like I said, I don't know if it truly exists because something always has to give. Um, but we're doing our best and that is something that you're going to struggle with for a long time until you figure it out. Now, if you're a single guy or single girl and all you have to do is worry about work and the gym and, and eating good, good for you. But there's still even a balance there because you can get burnt out. And, you know, you're always at the dealership, you're always selling your number one, your number two, and, you know, you're killing all the time. You might need a few days or a vacation where it's like, I just, I need to sleep. So there's a work life and personal life balance uh, to be found. And if you can't find it, then just do your best to to deal with it. And uh, and that's what I've done. I've done that quite well. And my my family knows and my wife knows and my daughters know, even my dog knows, you know, that I'm trying to go to the next level. And there's sacrifices that have to be made on bo- both sides. You know, I'll miss a concert that my daughter did in a, a different town this last weekend, a two day concert. She's playing cello out there. And all I'm getting to do is do uh, FaceTime in, in videos and picture. It's a sacrifice. And darn it, I wish I was there. But guess what? I got work to do because when they get home, they got to eat and they need a roof. And so these are the things that we just have to deal with. And that balance is tough, but you know you do what you got to do to make yourself happy, and you do what you're what you got to do to make your 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 career happy. You got to feed that career. All right, moving on. Commissionable income, commission income. This is a struggle for people that just started or they've been in the car business for a shorter period of time. Is how do I live off of an income that's always different? And what I say to that is you work as hard as you can every single day and you don't get too many bills. And just because you had a few hot months doesn't mean you go finance a brand new truck and get yourself an 850 payment. Because guess what? What goes up must come down. So if you want to be able to survive off commission sales, kill it every month that you're there. Work hard. Grind, grind, grind. And when you start making those big checks... Know that this isn't going to last forever. There will be a down month. There will be a, a, a tougher season. And that's when you need to set yourself up for success and don't be buying three or four cool cars on, on credit. Pay cash for that stuff. If you want to be a baller, you go and pay, pay cash for something. Even if it's only a $10,000 car or a $5,000 car, the fact of the matter is, is you have the title. Collect titles. Don't collect payments. Titles in your dresser drawer, titles in your computer desk is way more impressive to me than a brand new truck that you have an 850 payment on. I would rather you have a title to a $5,000 vehicle than a title than a payment on a $80,000 Raptor. Because guess what? One guy there is making smart moves. The other guy there is making a, a bank rich. Now, if you can pull that 80 grand out of uh, uh, something that pays yourself back and you get the interest rock and roll but make smart moves in 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 your life and your commission income you will you'll be stress free because guess what all the money you're making you can sandbag all the money you're making you can save so if you want to get into commissions or you're in commissions and you might be new and you haven't figured this out we're struggling with commissions keep your bills low all right moving on dealing with toxic co-workers this is a good one. It's easier, but it is definitely good because toxic coworkers can pull us out of the game for the day. You know, you're let's say you're waiting for an up and, and you have this toxic coworker that's always negative helping a customer and nothing happens, a customer leaves. And now this toxic coworker, the salesperson, wants to tell you all the reasons why that customer wasn't buying, all the reasons why uh, he left, all the reasons why that he was an idiot, right? What really that what you need to be thinking is all the reasons why you couldn't close them, all the reasons why you couldn't get them on a test drive, all the reasons why you couldn't even open the vehicles to show them stuff because you might have a a, a tough customer in your head, but that was an opportunity and all the excuses you have is frying me. So toxic coworkers can pull you out of the game. So if you have a toxic coworker that just took an up and now he's walking straight towards you after that run, you go go find an up. Go walk away because you 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 could probably picture that salesperson right now. He just got done with the up and he's walking right towards you to tell you why that up was was bad. Okay? And you need to get out of there. Or you tell him, hey, save it. I don't want to hear it. Go do something else, man. Get better. And maybe next time you'll uh, close them. You know, if a toxic coworker 
is is okay with with filling your head with negativity, why can't you be okay with telling them to, hey, save it. Go tell someone else. He's okay. With, he's got the guts to tell you, you know, something to pull you out of the game. Why don't you have the guts to tell him to shut up and move on, man? I don't want to hear it. You get better at closing and tell that toxic coworker to get lost, man. Because really, they, uh, a, a toxic coworker, toxic salesperson, can pull you out of the game for two or three hours. Oh, guess what? Every customer today is going to be bad. You know, you got to be strong and you got to fight uh, to to keep your head clear and keep your head in the game. All right, moving on. Dealing with uh, your dealership buddy. Now, this one's a little bit tougher because you can't tell your dealership buddy to pound sand. This is a, a, a person at your dealership that helps get you through the day. This is a person at your dealership that you have things in common with. You may hang outside of work with this person and there's no way you're going to tell them to get lost and get better, you know, why don't you train and get better at, at selling? No, this is someone that you that you respect. This is someone that is, is kind to you. However, this kind buddy of yours could pull you out of the game just as bad as the toxic salesperson. This buddy of yours might talk to you about you know a topic that you guys have in common for forty five minutes, and and you're kind of intrigued, but you, in the back of your head you're thinking, man, I got to get to work. But because you guys are coworker buddies, it's hard to tell them no. It's hard to say or her like, hey, I got to work, man. Because you don't want to offend that person. You don't want to lose that relationship because that relationship gets you through the day. Someone to talk to while you wait for ups. There's someone to talk to about your hobbies. So how do we t- deal with a dealership buddy that ends up wasting two or three hours of your day talking about random stuff? This is how you deal with it. You talk with your dealership buddy about getting to the next level together. Training on the car business together. And when they start talking about, uh, you know, football or something, wrestling, whatever it is, UFC, MMA, boxing, this is the time to say, I, I, I'm going to go outside and take some ups. You got to cut them off at the past and, and try to make it to where you condition them that every time they talk about non Car business, you get up and go take an up, or hey, let's go take some ups, or hey, let's have you seen the new uh, training program, the new certification training we got to do? Hey, I got to get mine done. You switch it to car business immediately, and they won't even know that you're trying to cut them off at the pass. You don't want to talk 45 minutes about football because you got to sell a car, you got to make money. And the dealership buddy is a tougher one to deal with. So anytime the dealership buddy comes around, talk to him about the car business. Talk to them about how can we sell more cars? Hey, how can we be number one and two? How can we do this? You want to do some walk around training? You want And switch it to training. Switch it to both of you guys or girls going up to, to the next level and trying to get better. And you'll start training that person that when they come to you, your business, it's all business. And guess what happens? They still want to be your dealership buddy. They still want to be around you. And guess what starts happening when they walk up to you? They want to talk about the car business. You got to train yourself and you got to train your dealership buddies that, hey, I'm here to sell cars and you don't have to tell them in a rude way. Just every time they come up to you, talk about training. Hey, let's go do a walk around. Let's, I'm trying to get better at my walk arounds. Let's go do some walk arounds or let's go take an up. That's how you deal with it. And that's a struggle we have. Trust me. I dealt with it for years. How do you tell this person to pound sand? I got to sell cars when this is my dealership buddy. That's how you do it. You talk about training. You talk about getting better. You talk about car business. You talk about certification trainings. You talk about new products. You talk about the competition. You talk about closes. You talk about car business. And you'll start getting better, and so will your dealership buddy. All right, moving on. Something we definitely struggle with is recovering from a, a bad attitude customer. It's it's so much easier said than done to to let the, the words and the irritation of uh, a customer affect us or roll off our back it's easier to say than than do and how do we deal with that it it truly is uh something that affects us as car salespeople. you're out there you spend an hour with them and they end up getting rude or they don't want to talk about numbers and they say they got a better deal over here and next thing you know you're you're more irritated than you've ever been with this customer because you just spent some good quality time you have to understand there's still value in customers that have a bad attitude there's still value in uh, a customer that might be irritating to you because guess what? 
they're a customer and they're on your car lot. So make it a game with these people of, okay, this guy may have just come from a bad dealership. Let me see if I can turn him around. Let me see if I can use my charisma and my charm to turn this guy around. And you keep hitting him, man, hitting him with fun stuff, hitting him with, with, with your charisma, hitting him with your personality. And you keep fighting to try to convert that customer into someone that's pleasant. Or you convert them into a sale. Now, if you want to get rid of them real fast, this is the fastest way to get rid of a customer that's irritating you. You start asking closing questions. You start saying stuff that moves them along in the process. Hey, are you thinking about trading your car? Well, no. Well, uh, why not? You know, we can get it appraised. You start pushing the, the, the car sale on them. They're either going to blow out or crumble. But if you have a customer that's tougher, use that as a, a, a... an experience uh, commission. Hey, I'm going to try to turn this guy around. He's got a bad attitude. I don't want him to let let it affect me. I might as well try to sell him a car because this is what happens with customers like that. That could just be their personality. They may be abrasive. They may be a person that doesn't like anybody. But if you can win them over, that's the type of customer that will never buy from anybody else. They'll send you everybody. And the next time you see them, they have a giant smile. You've totally converted that that bad attitude attitude customer, the rude customer, into somebody that is your advocate, that's talking about you, leaving you good reviews, and you've converted them into a lifetime customer. So let's say you do have a tough customer and they blow out and, and you're irritated. Okay, take a five, 10 minute break, get something to drink, clear your head, let it roll off your back and say, okay, hey, I learned something today. Uh, that type of customer doesn't like this type of verbiage. But you might you might turn in turn something into a car deal with these customers. So uh, you know, do your best to sell them something because someone has to sell them a car. They're driving a car, and someone has sold them before. So make it a game that I'm going to turn this person around. Okay. Sometimes we struggle with our own mental health. We can be our own worst enemy. There have been so many times in my career where I thought, Why am I doing this? I'm not even that good at it. I get beat every month. You know, and, and uh, a lot of that was in my earlier years in the career, but it still happens. It still happens to us. We are our own worst enemy. No manager has ever said anything to me that I haven't said 10 times worse to myself. It's our own mental game and our own mental health. And, th- you know, being in the car business is tough. The car business, like I said, will test us. And there's days where you want to give up. And there's nights where you're like, I just want to go home and, and cry and curl up in bed. I'm not cut out for the car business. But those are also the times that if you can work through it, it gets easier and easier every time. The key is not to panic. It could be the 20th of the month and you're at one car. If you panic, you'll finish at one car. If you can keep your cool and keep your head on straight, you might be able to squeeze out eight more cars and at least finish at nine and salvage your month. Um, because you'll hit on, you'll get on a roll. Um, so when it comes to mental health in the car business, treat yourself good and pat yourself on the back when you have successes and don't be so hard on yourself when you have failures. As long as you're not doing anything illegal or stealing or, or lying, really you're doing a good job. And I feel like right now at this point, you should pat yourself on the back. Just the fact that you're listening to the podcast. Hold on. There's my back. Uh, you know, let's just let's be kind to ourselves and kind to other people at the dealership because guess what? We're all struggling. And when I say sometimes we struggle for this episode, really we struggle every single day and every single month. It just varies on the on the topic of what we're struggling with, right? All these different topics we struggle with at all different times. So if you think there's a perfect salesperson out there that doesn't struggle with anything, it's false. Don't lie to yourself about it. Everyone is struggling. No matter how pretty it looks on the outside, we all are struggling in the car business. We're all trying to make a check. We're all trying to get ours. We're all trying to go to that next level. And the fact that you're still trying and and you're listening to an episode and you're trying to get better tells me a lot about your character. And I applaud you for that. So when it comes to mental health, be kind to yourself and tell yourself that you're doing a good job and look in the mirror and say, I like that person and I'm going to make it to the next level. I am going to become a sales titan and tell yourself every, every single day and don't be too hard on yourself. 
I, I, I'm saying this with passion because we can go down dark places in our careers. We can go down dark places in our life where we, we want to give up. It's like, what's the point? But don't do that. You fight for it. And guess what? Help someone else. Sometimes when, when you're in a dark place, if you can help someone else, it'll pull you out of it. Help train somebody. Help someone get better at what they're trying to do. And next thing you know, you have purpose again. And and now it's like, oh, my career is reinvigorated. I, I'm, I'm getting good at selling cars again because I'm helping people. This podcast has helped me tremendously because I'm talking about the car business after work hours. I'm not just waiting to go to the dealership to train. I'm not waiting to go to the dealership to get my mind in the car business. I think and I even dream about car deals at this point in my career. I literally dream about car deals. It's weird and I actually like it, but that's me. And I'm weird when it comes to the car business. But guess what? This is what makes me tick and and I, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back and I want to give you a digital pat on the back. Hold on. There you go. There's your pat on the back to all you guys out there. All right, here's another thing that we struggle with and that's a toxic manager. When I'm on Reddit looking through people's car sales uh, training posts, rate my pay plan, uh, help me, how can I sell more cars, what do I do about the, the slow times, I just saw one that said, how do I deal with my toxic manager, he's a jerk, he's a da da da, he's this and that, and a lot of comments out there are you know, telling them, oh you're screwed, if he's your only sales manager, you're screwed, um, You know, maybe he's having a bad day, I know how to deal with toxic managers, I talk with them. Go out and talk with them. Now, if you're a salesperson and you have a manager that's toxic, figure out figure out an angle that you can get inside uh, inside his kindness zone or on a different level with him. And this is how I, I would do it. I would ask that sales manager, hey, when you get a chance, can I have 10 minutes of your time? I want to pick your brain about the car business. And... It's not just pick your brain. It's pick your brain about the car business. And this session is not to complain about how he's acting or how she's acting and how you feel like it's a toxic environment. No, let's let's pick their brain. There's a reason why they're sales managers or or a general sales manager. They've made it to the top somehow. There's some skill in there. What they've forgotten is is how to act normal. What they've forgotten is that salespeople have hearts and souls and minds and they're they're people. So what what I would do is talk with that toxic sales manager about the car business. Hey, I'm really trying to make myself a ton more money, which in turn makes you a lot more money. I'd like to pick your brain about what did you do when you were a salesperson to get more sales, to get more customers, to make it to where you're at now. It's kind of buttering up him a little bit or her, but really write some stuff down. How did you do it? Did you do it at this store? And and pick their brain, and you'll get to a different level with that salesperson, that sales manager. And guess what? They won't be toxic towards you anymore because they see you a little different than the normal salesperson. What they're tired of, in my opinion, is is possibly their job, or possibly they're not making enough money, and they've given up on their career. Well, maybe the fact that someone is interested in getting help from them may reinvigorate them. And yes, you don't want to have to babysit this manager and and walk on pins and needles around them. But if you're truly trying to find a way to deal with the toxic manager, this would be my way of approaching it. I would talk with them. I would set up a 10-minute meeting. I'd pick their brain on how they got where they're at. I'd pick their brain on, on tips and tricks in the car business. And I'd write stuff down. And I'd finish it with, I want to make a tremendous amount of money so I can make you a tremendous amount of money. And you watch that that sales manager that manager's personality tra- change towards you you might become their favorite and start getting spoons i don't know but it's worth a try because if you just talk smack about this manager behind their back or you don't do anything about it you don't stand your ground in a smart uh in a smart way in a strategic way then guess what he's just going to be or she's going to be toxic toward you towards you your whole career and you cannot work in a toxic environment and expect to go to the next level so what you have to do is sell your sales manager that you're looking out for him in the store and yourself and you want to pick their brain and put on a show and guess what that toxic manager might change her his or her ways it's worth trying but that's how how i would approach it now I know there's a lot of topics. We're at 48 minutes, and I'm coming up on my last uh, topic. But of course, there's more. This episode could go on for uh, so many hours, but 
I, I got to stop somewhere. So the last one I'm talking about is inventory, right? A lot of dealerships right now are struggling with inventory. I know we are. Our inventory is low. But there's two ways I can think about it. I can say, hey, at least I'm blessed with what I got and I have a job. Or I can complain about it and rot my own brain and, and be upset about it. The, the fact of the matter as a salesperson, you got to work with what you got. Is there 10 or more cars on your lot? Then you could sell 10 that month. At least work with what you got. And and know that, hey, I have to get mine. So we may be light on inventory, but there's still enough inventory on this car lot for me to make 10 grand this month. There's still enough inventory on this car lot for me to sell and become the number one salesman this month. I can still be salesman of the month with the inventory I have. We can't do anything about the inventory if the manufacturers are slow. We could put 100 orders in, but if they're only filling 20, then that's all we're going to get. There's nothing I can do about it. When it comes to used cars and, and pre-owned vehicles and your managers are going out trying to get inventory at the, the auctions or they're trying to buy vehicles from customers on the street, you got to work with what you got. So when it comes to inventory, this is a struggle of all time. Um, but just worry about what you got to do this month and worry about, okay, these are the vehicles I do have. I'm going to make the most of it and I'm going to do everything I can to sell what I have in stock and convert these buyers, these customers into buying what I have in stock, not trying to put in a dealer trade that we won't get or an order that takes six months to a year or or something, right? The used car factory. What would you like? 50,000 miles on it? Do you want a couple dents or not? Okay, excellent. There is no used car factory. So what we got to do is sell what we have. So focus on your inventory. Learn your current inventory and try not to stress about it. Look at the positive light. We have a job. We have some inventory to sell and there's enough inventory on my lot to become number one this month and making make 10 grand. I just have to put on my sales shoes and get them to buy what I have in stock. Now, the car business has been around before we were even born. Can we all agree to that? Yes. Raise our hand. The car business has been around since before we started, before we were born. And guess what? After we all retire and we all die, the car business will still be around. So yes, there's going to be struggles throughout our career. But guess what? In the big picture, it's just a small period of time. So try to stay positive. Try to uh, focus on yourself. Try to love your job, love your career, and have passion. And fight every day to be the, a better version of yourself. Because the better version of yourself sells more cars. And if you can become that version of yourself, guess what? There's another version of you. But the only way you can get to that final version is if you get to the next version and the next version and you keep shedding that skin and, and, and going to the next version of yourself and growing in the car business. Because if you want to be the very best of at your dealership or even your city, your town, you have to go to the next level. You can't go from this is my first month on the, on the car lot to I sell 30 cars a month and I've been doing it for since the beginning of my career. No, it doesn't work like that. No one is an anomaly. The way they do it is work ethic and learning and experience and trying new things and getting brave with customers and trying different closes and not letting them leave. The be back bus does not come back. So so if you want to get to the sales titan status and sell 15, 20, 20 plus a month, then you have to start training. You have to start doing stuff. Now I want to throw one little thing out there. I got a message from Scott Stevenson on Facebook. Shout out to Scott Stevenson. He's tied for first place this month. He sent me a message. He goes, it's a little bit slow, but I'm tied for first. And guess what he's using every single day? The Poor to Pro Daily Workbook. Get on Amazon. Look at my links. There's a Titan Edition, which is a big color. And then there's the, the Standard Edition. It's only $14.99 and $19.99. Such a tiny investment. But he's number one at his dealership. And he attests to the... The, the book, it's such a small investment, it keeps you on track. Yes, I'm plugging my own book, but I made it for you guys and girls to buy. And Amazon doesn't let me make it any cheaper than cheaper than it is. It goes negative. Okay, so I Amazon said I have to make a couple bucks per book. F so be it. Go over there and buy that book and start there. Start with your daily workbook. Open a page up and say, okay, 30, 30 pages. Well, it's actually 72 pages. 72 pages. Every single month, 
I'm going to finish this book every single month. And guess what happens? Your sales will go up. It's inevitable. You guys made it to almost an hour. I appreciate this. Remember, we're all struggling out there, but we're either struggling to get better or we're letting the struggle take us down. All we struggle to get better. The car business will test us. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please share this episode. Kyle Galaz, signing out.